Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So thank you for the organizers uh, to help me uh, give this presentation. Uh, so you already introduced me. So I'm Denis I work at Onera, and I I give here a talk on flow reconstruction using data simulation and resolvent analysis. Um, so uh, actually, data simulation is about uh, uncertainties, and uncertainties can come from experiments and also from CFD, actually. So in, in experiments, yeah, I've just put some slides together of what we do a little at ONERA in terms of experiments. So we have wind tunnels, we have models, we have measurement techniques, and various measurement techniques that are force balances, field measurements, and so on. And of course, when you do experiments, there are lots of uncertainties. And here I just list uh, a number of them. Of, of course, for each measurement, you have a measurement uncertainty, but you also have uh, boundary conditions, issues in experiments. So how is the upstream flow in the wind tunnel? What is the surface quality of the, of the model? Uh, that can be also deformation, uh, vibrations, so you you can you can there can be errors in positions. So these are all uncertainties that exist when you do experiments and measurements. On the other side, when you do CFD computational fluid dynamics, you always have a model actually, except if you have if you are on the DNS side, which is on the top. But the more you but of course DNS is very expensive, so you can more or less model uh, a, a big or small part of, of the dynamics. So on the other side, what I put here is runs. So here you have just a steady flow field and you have modeled a lot. So the two, the two extreme part you see on the upper left, this is more something like LES DNS where you sell, solve everything. And on the lower part, you have runs modeling where you uh, runs computation where you model a lot of stuff. And depending on this, on the, fidelity, on the fidelity of these computations, you have here other uncertainties. So the first of which is mod modeling. So depending if you have runs or LES, uh, there are more or less uh, uh, errors. But you also have, of course, errors in boundary conditions, errors in discretization, because you can have a mesh which is not fine enough. And you can also have numerical resolution uh, problems, like you don't, uh, at each time step, solve the equations how you should do. So data simulation is both is finally combining these two worlds and uh, try to to tune uncertainties and try to make them match. So that's the starting point of data simulation. So uncertainties in both experiments and CFD and data simulations can be in some sense defined as let's say tune uncertain parameters in a model that's in a, in a CFD here it's CFD model in order to match given experiments. So you see here there is the CFD part and the given measurements, of course, are uh, in the experiments. And this matching, of course, is within measurement uncertainty. So it's always about uncertainties. So basically, to deal with data simulations, there are two main techniques in the, uh, in the, in the literature and in the field and uh, the community. There are ensemble methods where basically you try to uh, uh, to, to tune the uncertainties by representing the uncertainties by ensembles. This is basically what I have represented here from a sketch by uh, Da Silva, where you have, uh, this is a position, X1 and X2 is a position that you try to estimate where there is, is, uh, 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 where there is uh, uncertainty. And this is the initial location that you estimate. And this is a, an ensemble, you have, let's say, 100 points inside here. And then you have a model which will propagate these uncertainties, this ensemble into a prediction. And finally, you will take your measurements and make the intersection between the prediction, which is the modeling part, the CFD part, and then measurement, which is the experimental part. And finally, you have what is the update. You have, a, 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 you have a, a something which is in between, in between the experiment and between the, the CFD. So this is uh, when we when you when you look at ensemble methods. My talk, because my background uh, is more from optimization, will more more deal with variational models. So this is called usually 3D var, uh, 4D var, and uh, basically you do exactly the same thing. So you have still x1, x2, which are uncertain positions, 
But this time you try to minimize a cost functional where you have the two parts. First, there is the measurement uncertainty. You have M, which is the measurement from the model, M bar, which is the measurement from the experiment. And then you have a covariance matrix, which is linked to the measurement, which is the, which is the error measure. And then you have also a state covariance, which takes the, which considers the, the, the modeling uncertainty. And this is given here by CX. And basically by minimizing uh, this cost functional, you have an X min, which will be the same as the update, which was here, but done in a different way. So here we have two techniques to do that. And I will focus on variational methods because I already, I always did that and uh, I never did ensemble methods. So I focus on the second part. So uh, in terms just of history, uh, data simulation came from meteorology some years ago. And it was introduced more in aerodynamics and in measurements in particular uh, since 2010, something like this, because, uh, for example, PIV measurements today, to, Im to improve some measurements, people combine uh, assimilation and measurements to, to improve their measurement techniques. But in the, in ca in, in the case of aerodynamics, uh, it was more Cato and then other uh, other. Uh, other people came more into the aerodynamics, like uh, Mons, uh, Vincent Mons, also Sean Simon, where I collaborated with. But no, there are more, much many more people. So that's just from historical side. So now, when we want to make data simulation, basically you can you can reconstruct two kinds of things. Uh, first of all, this is an LES simulation where you have small fluctuations, unsteady fluctuations. And the first thing you can do is try to reconstruct unsteady fluctuations. This is usually what is done, I would say, commonly in data simulation, because you have an unsteady problem and you, for example, try to predict the initial condition uh, to best match uh, 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 measurements. But you will see that in aerodynamics, there is another thing which can be very, very useful and which is of prime importance is mean flow quantities. So of course, this is a, a post-processing of the unsteady. So if you manage to do the unsteady reconstruction, you can also have the, the mean flow uh, reconstruction. But you can, you can also say that if I, if I manage just to recover the mean flow quantities, maybe it's cheaper, OK? And maybe it will be less expensive to do that. And we will see that actually in aerodynamics, mean flow quantities is, uh, is something that is uh, super important for industry. And for example, these are wind tunnels at Onera, quite industrial wind tunnels at Onera. And when there is a, a, a product development uh, like a new airplane or something like this, 99.99% of the measurements are all time average. So you have the time average of CL, you have the time average of pressure, you have nearly time average everywhere. So this is one of the motivation I have here for making a specific uh, data simulation procedure, which just deals with mean flow quantities. So that's the outline of my talk. So I will have uh, four parts uh, dealing with either mean flow quantities, these are the two first and the last, or unsteady quantities. And the, the means, uh, how I will do that, is basically different, you see. Uh, Reminder of what is the Reynolds decomposition. I will go quickly because everybody knows this. So you have the velocity field that you decompose into a mean, a time average, and the fluctuation. And if you plug that into the Navier-Stokes equation and take the mean, you end up with that equation where you have the U bar, which is the mean solution, which is here. And this mean solution is of course dependent on the fluctuation, which which are here. So Depending on a good modeling of this U prime, you will have a good or bad uh, result in terms of mean, what, what we want actually, we want to predict the U bar. So we need the U prime. So basically, if your U prime is zero and you solve this equation, you have what is called the base flow. And you have here, in the case of a cylinder, a very large bubble. But if you take into account the fluctuation, which is U, the U prime, and you have the Reynolds stresses, you get here on the right, the right bubble. And so we are interested in this. So basically, we need to model this. So here, there are different ways now to do that. So the first way to do that 
is directly tuning the F bar. You see here we have this force, and basically what we can do is directly tune this F, which is here. So here we just have Navier-Stokes equation with, with a new lamina, la, uh, molecular viscosity, and we try to, to, to find F. And we try to find F, of course, such that the mean flow solution bar is as close as possible to external data measurements, so in terms of measurements. And what my point is, is that this strategy is well suited at moderately high Reynolds numbers, but it will fail at very high Reynolds numbers, which are, for example, applications in aeronautics. And here I will just give uh, an example, which I did with uh, Sean Simon when he was in, in, in Caltech. So this is an experiment where you see an, an aeronautics here. The red uh, parts here, these are peak measurements. So these are uh, windows for peak measurements. And here on the lower, lower right, you have a close-up of this experiment. And here, in terms of PIF, only one out of five are represented. So this is the experimental world, which is on the right. And if you look at the CFD world, so we have implemented the equation, which is on the top, and we solve, with, we solve it with a Newton equation, and then we try to, to minimize with an optimization procedure. And the CFD, you see, there are, is much finer. So you can try to... To, to reconstruct the flow field with a much uh, better accuracy. So the results of this are just represented here. So on the top left, you have the PIV, the PIV measurements here with one point out of three. Here on the right, we have the initial condition that we give to the optimization algorithm. So here you can see that the Reynolds number here is 2015, 500, which is different from the actual one. So that's because uh, 13, uh, that, that's because this Reynolds number is already sufficiently high, so we had to initialize at quite lower Reynolds number, and then we went up to the true Reynolds number, which was there. So it was a little tricky, but Sean made a wonderful work there. And, oh, sorry. Just away, sorry. And so finally, uh, after, after optimization, we obtain this assimilated field where we try to match the PIV uh, on, on just on, on few points here, and this is the assimilated field. And so you can see also that the assimilated field is also uh, there uh, on the lower side, while it was absent here because uh, the, 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 the laser sheet did not uh, illuminate on the lower side of the model. So what I wanted to say is that this strategy is possible for moderately high Reynolds numbers, and, uh, but it, it is difficult. And if you want to go even at higher Reynolds number, you will have problems for initialization. You will have problems of what is the, the to find the minima and uh, even, try, even find initial conditions. And because of that, we, we went to uh, next strategies where we consider turbulence model. So you can see that here, we don't have any more the Reynolds stress, but we have a model. So I will come back to this just afterwards. Or we can have also another strategy that, that we investigated. Both of these strategies were investigated in the PhD of Lucas Franceschini. And here we can also try to take for you prime resolvent modes. And I will come back to this uh, 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 later in the talk. So here we have two new strategies, one which is more turbulence modeling with a turbulence model and one which is more based on resolvent modes. So now I come to the second part here. So reconstruction of mean flow quantities with turbulence models. And this is a work that I did with Lucas, so a PhD student, and Olivier Marquet. So here I come back to the Rance equation. Here you have the Reynolds stresses. And now I introduce my model. You see here, this is a Boussinesque approximation, which we will see is a little constraining. But a Boussinesque approximation is usually known to perform well in shear layers, in um, in boundary layers, everything that is just uh, uh, quite smooth and, and where is just diffusion. And the spalar Almaras model, we picked one model, which is the spalar Almaras. I just represented like this, where you have convection, diffusion, and you have here a source term where there is production and destruction of, uh, of uh, eddy viscosity. And we will see that this Rance model usually uh, performs approximately well. Of course, the uh, Rance equations are not perfect, but it gives a first order, uh, a first order uh, approximation of, of what the flow field should be. 
But I would like to stress the fact that RANS models have deficiencies. They are, they are basically not good for a lot, for, for, for even quite simple flows. For example, this is a, a very simple case where you just have a bump here, a, 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 a small bump. The flow is actually attached. So this is the red curve here. Here we represent skin friction uh, as a function of the X coordinate. And you can see that the flow field is attached everywhere because the skin friction is positive everywhere. And depending on the turbulence model that you use, so uh, basically uh, you can use a two, uh, a two equation model like K omega, you can see that this guy is, uh, exhibits a separation, so it's bad. But you can even go to very good uh, turbulence models like RSM, which are Reynolds stress models. Even in this case, there are deficiencies. It's better than the two equation model because the RSM doesn't separate, you see, it's, it's, it's closer to the red curve and doesn't separate, but it's still quite far away in terms of skin friction with respect to the, 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 the truth. So that, my point was to say that runs turbulence model are good for order one, but not very good. And for this, I think they are a good candidate to, to make a data simulation because you can tune this turbulence model. So this is basically my model that I showed you before. And here I have introduced uh, actually two tuning terms. You see FU and FNU T were zero, were zero just before. And here we introduced two ways of uh, correcting this business the, 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 the model. So there is one uh, term, uh, FNU T, which will correct the production term and the, the, the destruction term. This is kind of analog of what Durezemi and Singh does when he tries to optimize his beta here. But here we felt it was more easy to, 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 to introduce a source term, which is space dependent, and uh, that we will tune to, to match measurements. So this is one, uh, one possibility. But another possibility is also to correct directly on the momentum equations level. So you introduce here an FU, and this has an enormous advantage because you can go you can go out of the constraint of the businessque uh, of the businessque um, uh, term because businessque as uh, all turbulence uh, modeling people say is extremely constraining and is not valid in a uh, outside of of very simple flows so we will see actually two ways of correcting either fu or fut and we will try to see uh, what are the performances of these two ways of uh, correcting uh, turbulence models to match measurements. So uh, the technique, our, our, our technique in terms of uh, minimizing uh, cost functional, uh, we have uh, here uh, uh, the cost functional that I introduced here. So here it is the discrepancy between the, the, the measurement of the model, which is here, and the true measurements which are linked to, exper to the experiments. So this is my cost functional. Here, I didn't consider any state covariance, but we'll see later that we can introduce one. So uh, no, this is the cost functional. And here we introduce the governing equations. These are exactly the Spalar-Almaros model with my two correcting terms, FU and FNUT. And my control parameters are these two. And then we introduce a Lagrangian to try to compute the two gradients. So here we have the cost functional, and here we have the gradient with respect to FU and FNUT, and this will enable us to minimize this cost function in a very efficient way using gradient and uh, a, decent a decent algorithm, which is here LBFGS. And uh, so it's quite easy to do that. Uh, we just uh, combine all these uh, different things, the gradients and LBFGS, and then we manage to uh, to to diminish the, the menu and to optimize FU, FU and FNUT. So here I introduce a test case. So this is the test case where we tried this. So it's a backward facing state, something like this, a round backward facing state. The Reynolds number is something like 28,000. And the truth here is a DNS simulation that was uh, performed by Julien Dandois. So Julien Dandois performed the, the DNS simulation and he gave us a, a time arranged uh, uh, solution, which is which is uh, here, and you can see that the flow field separates uh, in the backward facing set. So this is separation, and on the Lua 
part of this uh, here. You have on the on the on the left wall friction, and on the right wall pressure as a function of uh, the x coordinate. And you have the truth, which is the black solid line, and you have the Ranz Palar Almaraz. And what you can see that is that the Ranz Palar Almaraz is very bad in this in this configuration. You can see this is the truth. And this is the Ranz Palar Almaraz. So you can see that the bubble is much bigger with the Ranz Palar Almaraz uh, model. So what we try to do is to, to tune FU and F nu T uh, separately to try to match measurements. So in terms of measurements, we will consider two cases. We will first take a, consider a case on the top where we have the whole velocity field. That means that at every point, we assume that we have a measurement. So it's a little like P measurement, which is very dense. So this will be the first step. And then we have a second uh, case where we, of course, go towards sparsity of measurements. And here, uh, we will use measurements uh, which are uh, along the, the green dots. So this mimics measurements in a wind tunnel where you have a hot wire that you, uh, that you that you move along a, a line. So first I will start with this one and I will see what my optimization uh, yields. So this is, the, this is the optimization history. Here you have the iteration in terms of LBH, in terms of the LBFGS uh, optimization algorithm. And here you have the cost functional that is minimized. And depending if you uh, optimize the F nu T or the F U uh, uh, term, you, uh, you manage to, 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 to match the measurements and the full flow field in a different way. So first of all, as you can see, if you look at, if you tune the, the business correction, you, you manage to tune the, to match the measurements in very closely. You see with an error, which is like 10 to the minus four. While if you have the turbulence model correction, this is the F nu T, the Spalar Almaraz model, you manage to to just to, 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 to go close to the measurements, but uh, in a very coarse way. And we will see that this is linked to the fact that here we are still in the Boussinesque approximation, which constrains the, the, the reconstruction very strongly. While with the Boussinesque, while with the Boussinesque correction, there is much more freedom for FU to try to fit the, the, the actual measurements. So uh, these are the overall results in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, reconstruction. Uh, if I if we know look a little better the fields. So here this is the reference mean flow, and this is the reference spalar almaraz flow. These are the pictures that I showed you just before. And now uh, after optimization, we will see that with the turbulence model correction. So this is the guy which uh, is still in the in the business constraint. We, 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 we try to, 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 to correct uh, the, the, the production and dissipation, the, the, the destruction term of the, of the new T field. We manage to be much closer to the bubble, which is here, and also much closer in terms of wall friction and wall pressure. But we are not exactly reconstructing the reference, which is here. We will see that no, um, uh, sorry, if we've, so this, that was with the F nu T. If we now go to the business correction, you can see that the bubble is now exactly the same as in the DNS. And we can see that the business correction is actually much more uh, uh, performant uh, to, 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 to reconstruct the uh, turbulence mean. So now we go into the case of sparse measurement before we were in, in, in the case of dense measurement. And we will see how these two modeling uh, uh, techniques, uh, how these two correction terms perform. So here, this is the case of the Boussinesque correction. So before, Boussinesque correction was much better than turbulence correction. We managed to do a better job. But here, you can see that if you, we just use sparse measurements, which are the green points, we have something that looks like the reference flow but it is extremely, uh, uh, there are wiggles everywhere. So ba basically, uh, this can be interpreted by the fact that the business correction can by basically uh, tune things very, very finely, but finally he has 
too few informations to be tuned everywhere. So basically, we have many inputs. This is FU, many inputs. We have a few outputs. These are the measurements along the points. And we have a very flexible model. And this makes it, and this makes it bad. And we will see, uh, uh, we will go a little further on this afterwards. Basically, uh, we have an inverse problem, which is uh, completely under underdetermined, but it is uh, too flexible. And this, it is, this one doesn't work in this case. If we now go to the turbulence co model correction, which is much more constrained uh, in, uh, in, the full de in the full case, uh, measurement case that we had before, it was much uh, weaker. But here, as you can see, it is nearly perfect. And here, this can be interpreted in, 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 in this sense. There are still many inputs because we optimize an F nu t over the whole spatial field. So there are still many inputs in terms of control parameters. There are no few outputs. OK, this is like before because there are only uh, green points, few green points, but we have a quite rigid model. So this is what is here. And uh, as the model is rigid, he doesn't uh, enable the, 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 the reconstruction to, 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 to introduce wiggles. And, and this makes it OK here. So here we are in the case where the turbulence model correction is better than the Boussinesque approximation uh, in the case of sparse measurement, while this was the other way around uh, before. So can we still cure the boostiness correction? I would say yes. Uh, the boostiness correction, uh, basically what we try to introduce here with the, with the magenta uh, term is uh, try to introduce state covariance information globally. And basically what we tell the algorithm is to penalize the gradients. So we know basically that uh, the Reynolds stress terms are not very, uh, there are no wiggles in, in, in the physics, okay, in the actual flow fields. So we can, on a physical basis, pe penalize this, uh, this term. And then we, we manage to cure this Boussinesque, uh, uh, this Boussinesque cor correction term. So these are basically uh, overall results. Now I just have a, a small uh, slide to try to understand a little better what is the flexibility and rigidity, rigidity of these two models? So here there is the FU correction term, and here is FUT correction term. And basically, what we introduce to understand this is the resolvent at zero frequency with respect to the forcing, which is delta F. So delta F is delta FU or is FUT. Okay. And L U bar minus one is the linearized equations around the model and which links a variation in delta F and delta U bar. And then what we try to do is to maximize the delta F uh, to uh, generate uh, 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 the, the biggest delta U, OK? And then if we look at this resolvent at zero frequency, we have singular values, which are here, which are the gamma I square over gamma zero square at zero frequency. And here, these are the singular values. And these are, uh, sorry, the, the, the index of the singular value. And these are the singular values. And as you can see, is that the F nu t model, the singular values drop very, very quickly. While the F u singular values, they stay above uh, uh, for, for a lot of uh, i's. So in terms of interpretation, this shows that with F u, the states that you can reach, you see the delta u bar that you can reach, the subspace is much more uh, high dimensional. Why in the case of F nu t, the space that you can reach in terms of delta u bar is much weaker. So that you can definitely say that F nu t is strongly constrained in terms of delta u bar that you can reach because you can basically just reach a, sub, a, 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 a subspace of dimension, let's say two, three or four. While with FU, you can reach a, a large dimension sp uh, space. And this explains a little better what is behind flexibility and rigidity of these two models. So now I go to the reconstruction of unsteady quantities. So I will not uh, speak anymore uh, here in this part of mean flow quantities. I will speak here of unsteady quantities with resolvent modes. And uh, this is a first a work. So just in terms. So first, I will look how uh, resolvent modes align with the 
which unsteady data, which is here as pod. And then I will show once they are aligned, how we can use this information to make unsteady flow reconstruction. And this first part is a, is a work uh, that I did with George, who is here, and uh, also when I was uh, in Caltech two years ago. So, um, so this here, so I will here introduce uh, a flow field, which is not of mine. So this is a simulation that has been done by Guillaume Brez. So I was not involved in all these computations, but these computations are extremely nice. This is a turbulent jet, unsteady, which is extremely unsteady. And uh, the question is, what are the unsteady? Oh, Sorry? Yes, is it okay? Uh, yes, I think it's okay. Yes, you can continue. Okay, so uh, here there is a, there are unsteady features. The question is how can we characterize unsteady features is in, in this turbulent jet? So you here you see here uh, snapshots, and we will first introduce uh, for people who don't know this what is what is called S pod spectral pod. So spectral pod is like pod but in the frequency domain. So I just briefly re remind this here. So spectral pod modes are basically uh, you, you consider the, the cross correlation matrix, which is here. So you have the U flow field, you have U star, which is the trans conjugate, and you look at the 2.2 time correlation matrix, which is the guy which is here. And, the, and the, the brackets here with T means a time average. And, uh, and then we take the, the, Fourier, uh, the Fourier transform of the C of tau, which is well defined. And then this is the cross spectral density tensor that we can approximate uh, with an ensemble average of Fourier transform. You see the U hats are a basic tra Fourier transform of uh, when you have data, you just pick uh, uh, small portions of data and then you make the ensemble average. And once you have this C hat, you can decompose this C hat uh, with an SVD and then you will make appear the U hats, which are called the S pod modes. And uh, there are also another very interesting features, the lambda one squares, which are the singular values, will give you the rank of the dynamics. Basically, if you have lambda one very big with respect to lambda two, then you have a fluctuation field at that frequency, at a given frequency, which is dominated by just one mode, okay? And this will be a very nice feature that we will look uh, uh, in the forthcoming slides. So what are the results? Again, I, have not, I, I did nothing in these results. I just picked the results from uh, Ethan uh, and so on. So these are the lambda squares where you have the strual number. This is the frequency. And here at each frequency, you have a series of eigenvalues, which are these singular values that you have here. Okay. And what you can see is that at each frequency here, if you represent the singular mode, you have different physical mechanisms. So for example, at very low frequency here, you have the structure which is here, which is very large scale. If you incre uh, increase uh, the frequency here, you can see that the scales become shorter. This is uh, normal, this is uh, regular, this is uh, classical. And if you go here even to 0.6 and, and 1, you see and see that the structures become smaller and smaller, and all these modes are basically linked to kelvin helmholtz uh, driven instabilities. And what you can also see in terms of feature is that the first singular value here is much bigger than the second for some frequencies, but not for all frequencies. For example, here, there are very uh, close, while here, the dynamics is, is low rank. So that means that there is here just one mode dominating the whole fluctuation field. So now what, so these are the data. And now we will try to do data simulation with this unsteady data in the same way as what we did before. So we introduce a model. So the model here will be uh, um, the, the Navier-Stokes equations, still the Reynolds decomposition, but instead of looking at the equation which was linked to the mean flow, U bar, we go a little further and look at the, the equation that is linked with the fluctuation. So here we have, uh, so this is nearly an exact equation, except this unity, this is nearly an exact equation where you have on the left, a linear operator here uh, around the mean flow, which is U bar, okay? And which is at either 
molecular viscosity, or we can add something, new T, because we'll see afterwards that we'll add a new T here. And here on the right-hand side, there is a, a forcing term, a driving term that, that is considered as unknown, which is an F prime here, okay? And this equation, which is complicated, you can re, uh, rewrite it in compact form here, okay? U prime is the fluctuation. This is the linear operator with nu t and u bar. And here there is the unsteady fluctuation. And here we, you can go again in the, Fourier, in the Fourier space and finally rewrite this equation. And here you have the link between input f hat and output u hat. And here in between there is the resolvent, the resolvent operator, which is dependent on the frequency. And once you have this model, okay, this matrix r u bar or this operator, you can uh, make a singular value decomposition of this operator. So we have this operator, which is a ba basically a matrix here, and you decompose it into uh, uh, optimal responses, u tilde, singular values again, and optimal forcings, which are the f tilde hat. And these uh, u tildes and f tildes, these are orthogonal bases and, uh, and uh, which characterize the dynamics linked to this operator. And these are the optimal gains. And so now we'll, we will see how these modes, the U tildes, which are here, can be linked to the, um, uh, the S-pod modes. So this is done here. So this is uh, quite classical and has been done in a series of uh, articles which are here. For this, we take again the spectral covariance matrix. This is what we did before. But here in U hat, we introduce the, the decomposition of the resolvent. And finally, we arrive at this equality, which is here, where U hat are the S pod modes and U tilde are the resolvent modes. Okay. And in between, there is the, var the, the, the covariance of the noise, which is the F hat, the covariance of the forcing. And basically, what we would like to have is that the U hats are equal to the U tildes. Okay. U hat is equal to the U tildes. Of course, this is not granted. This is not given uh, in, in any case. There are two specific, uh, very uh, specific conditions where you can uh, easily show that U hat is equal to U tilde. So S pod mode is equal to the resolvent mode. This is when the, the, when the resolvent is rank one, that means that the sigma one is very large with respect to sigma two. Okay, then you can show that the first S pod mode is equal to the first resolvent mode. And then there is another, uh, another condition, another, another case when the noise. Yeah, you see, you recognize the scalar product. And we will try to, to maximize this alignment. And uh, we penalize also new T so that we have just the, the weakest, the smallest amount of new T to achieve this. So again, we, we make something classical. We compute the gradient of the cost functional with respect to new t. And then here we use a steepest ascent uh, algorithm with a line search. So it's, it's not LBFJS, it's, 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 it's uh, more simple, uh, but it also works in this case. And so the results are here. So the two first lines are the same lines that I showed you before, s on the on the top. The, the resolvent modes, which are just with the regular viscosity, which is baseline, okay? And here you have the optimized one, okay? So when, I, when we optimize the, 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 the new T or the mu T. And now you can see that the first and third pictures always are very close. This is what you can see everywhere. And the scalar products are quite high everywhere. You see 0 0.80, 0 0.77, 0 0.96, 0 0.90. So we manage by tuning new T, we managed to, uh, to align all the scalar products uh, and align all the S-pod and uh, resolvent modes. And just to show you, these are the optimal muties that, we, that are linked to these two optimizations. So this works very well. And uh, finally here, we just looked at the dominant S-pod mode. We can also look at the subdominant mode. This is the second one. So initially, if you just Optimize, optimize alignment of the first s mode with the first resolvent mode, you can show that the optimal mu t is not that good. It is better than the baseline, but not that good. It's 0 0.38. But what you can also do is optimize uh, two, two, two modes, the first and the second together. And in this case, 
you have alignment of the first and the second mode very uh, in a very nice way. So in terms of overall conclusions, this is what is uh, on the right here. Uh, this is the baseline. These are the S-point modes. These are the resolvent modes. And this is the scalar product. And what we would like to have is something where it is black everywhere on the, on the diagonal. The baseline, it's not good at all. If we just optimize the first uh, mode, we have just alignment here. But if we optimize the two first alignments, you can see that we manage more and more to align all S-point modes with resolvent modes. And this is a very nice feature that we will know uh, uh, and we will now see uh, how we can use this nice feature. So here, uh, this is my, my third part, which has been done with Samir Benedin and Benjamin Leclerc at UNERA. So this is an experiment where we have PIV measurements. So this is a jet, so we are still in a jet, but at very low Reynolds number, 3,300. 3, and so here we know that there is a good alignment between uh, resolvent mode and s point modes. Here it, is, it works well, from the beginning, just with molecular viscosity. And what we have here is a, T, is a TRPIV measurements where there are unsteady fluctuations. And what we'll try to reconstruct is these unsteady fluctuations, okay? So basically, we will try to reconstruct this knowing just two things. First, the mean flow, which is here. So this is just the mean of, of, this, of this. And just at some point, we will say that we know the unsteady fluctuations which are here. Okay, so just by knowing this, okay, we can compute the resolvent modes, and then knowing this information on the bottom, we can tune the modes at different frequencies to try to reconstruct the flow for flow field everywhere. So just knowing these two things, okay, we manage to uh, obtain these results. So this is the ground truth, okay. And this is the reconstruction of the longitudinal velocity. This is the radial velocity. And you can see that these two pictures, these two movies uh, are very close. So basically just from uh, the knowledge of the mean flow and one point of unsteady fluctuations, we, ma we managed to completely reconstruct the flow field. So here we, with resolvents, we managed to have a, a, a good representation of the, of the dynamics. So here, I, I just come back uh, very quickly to the mean flow, uh, resol reconstruction of mean flow quantities with resolvent modes. You will see that it's, the idea is very simple. Um, basically, we come back to our equations that we had at the beginning, the mean flow equations, and here we have the Reynolds stresses. So now the idea is to say that for U prime here, we just take the resolvent modes because we assume that the, 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 the fluctuations, which are the U hats, okay, they are given in a very close way by the resolvent modes which are there. So if you plug this inside here, you basically manage to have a, 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 a Reynolds stress tensor where you have structures that are given by the resolvent modes, but you have and you have parameters that you have that you need to tune, which are just n scalars. So here we have n real contraparameters, which are just the, the amplitudes of the resolvent modes. And then what we basically need to do is to, to solve a discoupled system where we have the mean flow equation, which is there. We have the resolvent modes and we have to tune this guy, which is here, okay? And doing this, uh, we should manage to recover the U bar, okay? So if we do that, so this we have uh, done that with the cylinder flow, which is very simple, Reynolds 100, because it was very simple. There are the, the, the frequency spectrum is very simple because we just have peaks, discrete peaks. So the fluctuation approximation, we just take one mode here. So we just have one real control parameter to tune. And finally, we can take very uh, rough uh, information from the experiment or from the mean from the experiment from the experiment here for example we can take the length of the bubble and then we look at uh, we we vary the control parameter which is the modulus of a and then we look when the, the length of the bubble matches the experimental one which is 2.43 okay and what we can see here is that the modulus of a is something like 2.3 you can do the same thing by taking other information, for example, the mean drag. And here you find that A is also something like 2.22. You can also take other information. You can take lots of information. You just, take, you just need to have 
one information because you have one control parameter and fit the two. And then you have a reconstruction of the flow field. And for example, this is my final result where we have the DNS, the Fourier mode at uh, the peak. So this is the unsteady fluctuations and the Reynolds stress and everything. And this is the reconstructed flow field. And you can see that it works quite well. You see the two are, are, are very close. And this is a, a very nice reconstruction. Of course, in a very easy case because it's uh, Reynolds number 100, but we also uh, looked at more complicated case. So basically, this is uh, my slide of conclusions. Uh, just to say that there is a lot to do, still a lot to do. Uh, at Onera, we would like to go to very complicated applications because we have wind tunnels, very big wind tunnels. And basically, we would like to do the assimilation process on a very uh, complicated case, which is, uh, which is here. It's a, a, a case which comes from the high lift um, uh, uh, configuration workshop. And in terms of methodology, there is also a lot to do. Better take into account state covariance, go to more complex turbulence model, EA, RSM, DRSM, because we saw that Boussinesque is extremely constraining. Uh, also combine turbulence models and resolvent modes, okay? Because turbulence model can represent small scales while resolvent modes can represent the large scales. Uh, and uh, modeling of unsteady di uh, dynamics that once you have a tuned new T for each frequency, you can try to make super scale modeling and go a little in the line of what Duresemi does for mean flow reconstruction. We can do uh, models for LES uh, for unsteady fluctuations. So basically, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>